we just heard about retail shopping as a part of the travel industry, as part of China outbound. Here comes something totally different. Anas Christensen from Albatross and Tani Poor from Visit Greenland. Anas is a Dane who went to China, studied there and decided to settle and live in China. He's responsible for Albatross activities in China, from building ships to um, marketing. Uh, Albatross is making cruise trips, but not the traditional ones. They make adventure trips. We will hear more about that now. Tani is senior manager from Visit Greenland, a very unique and delicate destination. Together, they will tell us how they sell adventure trips to the Chinese market. Welcome, guys. I'm looking very much forward to this. Thank you very much for having us. I'm just going to start a slideshow. Today, uh, let's see, does it work? Thank you for the introduction, Yen. Um, I'm just going to say I won't be covering everything in this short presentation, but uh, I'll be introducing Greenland as a destination for Chinese travelers, adventure market, of course. And then uh, Anas is going to go into the nitty gritty about how to market through social media. So I've worked in the Greenland tourism industry for about six years, and I've met quite a lot of Chinese travelers along the way. And I myself, being Malaysian Chinese in heritage growing up in Australia, I have also been a tourist in Greenland and have lived there for five years. And there I can safely say that Greenlanders are very welcoming. They're a little shy uh, in a general statement, but they're very welcoming. And as a fun fact, they also joke around and say that um, they are the Nordic cousins of Asians. So Chinese people already have a head start to feeling at home in Greenland. It's the simple things that draw Chinese people to Greenland. It's remote, and we know how much Chinese people like to tick off things on the bucket list. So remote that most people haven't been there, and it's only the true traveled people who make it there. The pure fresh air and the water that you can just drink directly from the streams is a luxury that you don't really have to pay for. And the enormous grand nature pulls, especially if you normally live in a mega city. Greenland is quite unique because it has the Inuit culture and also Viking heritage and this mix of modern and traditional nature and urban lifestyle is it combines everything together. Greenland is the world's largest island and the world's low has the world's largest lowest density per capita. And with international trends changing, um, it's all points show that it's the adventurous souls who are looking to travel first to less crowded destinations and in smaller groups. And Greenland has never been a mass destination um, for tourism. It's exclusive, it's a little bit more expensive, um, and it's so far away that really but it's actually not that much. <laughs> so here I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the unique products that we have. Firstly, the seasons. We have between June to September, summer, which is the high season. And then February to April is the winter season, at least for the classic products. We do say that winter is from October to May uh, because there is snow all year round. There are very many different activities that you can do during this. And in order to make it easy for you, we have created something called the Big Arctic Five, which are different experiences you can try uh, in Greenland throughout the year. Some are only seasonal. So for example, dog sledding. Most of the time you can only try, um, experience that in the winter time. And Dog sledding is one of the oldest forms of transportation in Greenland. It is actually wasn't a tourist activity, but tourists had the chance to try this cultural experience, meet some people uh, who do this as a lifestyle and also experience Greenland's wonderful, expansive nature. Add on uh, during September to April, the Northern Lights. You can actually see the Northern Lights anywhere in Greenland even from your bedroom window. And that is actually a very different thing about uh, Greenland, going to Greenland and seeing Northern Lights. It is one of the best places to see it because of the low light pollution. 
there are not that many people living in Greenland, 56,000 people, and we are scattered across the coast. So it's so easy to walk 15 minutes out of uh, town and then see the dark night sky in all its dancing glory. Ice and snow, there are, you can see this all year round, of course. A midnight sailing among the icebergs is one of the classics, um, amazing experiences you can have there. But you can also do specifics like cross-country skiing, heli skiing, um, and also, if you dare, crossing the Greenland ice sheet. You need a little bit of practice for that one, though. <laughs> and also there's the pioneering people, which is the culture, and the whales, which you can see mostly in the summertime. So how do you get to Greenland? In a non-COVID-19 situation, you would be able to uh, travel directly from China through SAS, Air China and Sichuan Airlines from Hong Kong, Guangzhou, Beijing, Shanghai and Chengdu. And from Copenhagen, there are direct flights to Gengbuswak, which is the main airport hub. This allows you to transfer to all the different places. It's about four and a half hours to fly from Copenhagen to Gengbuswak. And also from Iceland, it's possible to fly to East Greenland and Nook all year round. It's a short flight, three and a half hours, uh, about three hours to Kudusuk uh, from Reykjavik or Kefl from Reykjavik. And seasonal flights are also available in Iluliset and Itokotomit. So even though Greenland is considered remote, it actually is still quite, con quite connected through Denmark and Iceland. Cruise is one of the most magical ways to see Greenland and experience it. And you can do things that you cannot experience through flying or any other way. You might visit communities who only get visits one or two times a year. So then you become a VIP and they will put on their national costume to greet the, the people who are visiting them. And of course, there's the grand nature and um, experiences for that you can see, for example, more wildlife. I'm going to now introduce three different destinations you can consider to visit. And this is uh, both during February, the summertime and October, which are like the main traveling destinations for uh, China, Chinese travelers. Gengluswak, as I said, is the main, uh, the main spot for landing in Greenland, main hub. And that's where the Atlantic flight lands. It is the only place which is inland in Greenland. And that's because the Americans uh, set, set up the Tula air, uh, the air base then. It's also the only place you can drive to the Greenland ice sheet. And there are many experiences you can try there. For example, flight seeing, uh, driving to the, to the Greenland ice sheet, seeing Northern Lights, one of the best places in Greenland to see it and the world. And of course, seeing wildlife like reindeer and muskox and snowheads, for example. So if I were considering going to Greenland, I would consider putting a layover in Gengselswak, either before or after uh, to extend the trip. North Greenland is probably the most uh, classic place that people go to during uh, to Greenland. And it's very majestic because it's the home to the Iluliset Ice Fjord, which is the um, most iceberg producing fjord in the world, and Umunak, which is the home of the Hart Mountain. It's a winter wonderland there. This photo is taken in February, and the lady is actually walking on the sea ice. It's one of those memorable experiences, which I think you don't forget. February is a cold time in Greenland, but it's also very beautiful. And you can try dog sledding, see northern lights, walk on the frozen sea ice, uh, go ice fishing, or even if you dare, sleep in an ice igloo. Nook is the capital, and uh, it has a population of 17,000 people. This is Mukadalen, which is the historic area of uh, the capital. And it combines the urban vibes with the city breaks with grand fjord experiences. The second largest fjord system in the world is just outside Nook. So you can go during the day, uh, one day to have great coffee, go shopping, go and see the art and history. And then on another day, 
try um, sailing out and going whale watching, seeing abandoned settlements, or going for nice walks of all degrees of difficulty. So these three places, of course, are very different whether you want to go during the summertime, in February, or in October. So you need to know exactly what you want to experience when you do that. But tips for itineraries, you would consider combining a trip with Denmark or Iceland since you already have to go there to transit through to get to Greenland. Denmark, you could, for example, do the shopping and a little bit of culture and food and see the Little Mermaid, for example. And then, or you could consider doing Iceland and have more of an Arctic nature experience there and the urban capitals of the Arctic. Most of the time, you do need to consider planning in some time, uh, overnighting in Copenhagen, for example, as the flight to Greenland leaves very early the morning after or arrives the evening uh, late at night. And of course, the bigger the town, the more options there are, three to four star hotels and more food options. We do like small groups, um, and that's because of the nature of the infrastructure in Greenland. Ten to a boat is ideal, for example, when going on trips. And there's also the weather. So I'm going to, you need to say that um, you need to leave space to be flexible. And that's a great way to segue to Anas's presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. And um, yes, my name is Anders Christensen. I uh, work for Albatross Travel here in China. And um, I'm happy that Tenny had time to help me introduce China, uh, Greenland to, uh, <laughs> to you all today. Because um, I started out my career when I was in university, my travel uh, career, um, going on what we call the, the, the long haul of Asia, which is from Beijing to New Delhi, where you cross over Tibet. And the only thing I've ever found comparable to this trip, which is, I still think, the greatest trip in Asia, uh, especially the Tibet area and the fall into Nepal, is Greenland. So uh, the first time I went to Greenland, um, about 12 years ago now, it blew my mind. And it still does every time. Um, but it is, um, to be frank, it can be a headache for a travel agent because uh, you have something unique, special that you want to share. But um, you are also faced with a lot of logistic issues. Um, and also Greenland as a destination, um, it's not, a, as Tani said, it's not a mass tourism destination. You can't put 50,000, 100,000 Chinese there, nor would you want to. Um, and again, it's priced differently than some of the other Arctic areas that you will notice. So um, we have in Albatross tried over a long period of time now, almost eight or seven years, to find the right formula for Chinese tourists. And uh, we've had some great successes, uh, but it is a work in process. And that's sort of what I wanted to share with everyone today. Um, what are we doing? And um, what are the experiments that work for us? And what are the experiments that failed? Um, and I've prepared a little slide for you based on that. Um, so if that could come up, that would be great. Um, and it's basically going to show you how we use the social media uh, to 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 create uh, and to do the the stuff. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> technical stuff. Is it better now? Uh, here we go. Maybe. Oh, yeah, something. You need up. to start share. Screen sharing. Um, screen sharing. Yeah, I, I did that, and then it it worked just now. No, it's gone. You see anything now? No. Oh, weird. Okay, try again. Hmm. I started the screen sharing there. Okay, I'll try one more time. Quick glitch. And then, no. That work now? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, there you go. Well, I'll have to try out without then. I can see it though. There you go. Uh, hmm. Does it work now? Still no. Doesn't really work for me. 
All right. Did you see it now? Don't no. know. Ah, there you go. Well, I guess I have to um here maybe. Is that better? Yes. Ah, there we go. Cheers. So this is just short about albatross travel. Uh, our owner, San Rasmussen, uh, is a biologist by trade. Um, he loves Greenland with all his heart, um, together with Africa. He started doing it since the 90s with polar crews, and he's been doing Greenland, uh, well, uh, way even before I was born. So he knows what he's talking about um, when he wants us to go to Greenland. Um, he did also create the Great Wall Marathon here in China. Um, and he has been working again in China since the late 80s. So um, Albatross has a long, long standing relationship with China and with Greenland. Um, and I guess that is why we um, we are still considered to be one of the largest suppliers here in China, both of uh, cruises to Antarctica and to the Arctic. Um, um, and why we are still working on, working very hard on trying to get Chinese to Greenland. Um, if I move on in my presentation, um, I should be able to see the travel companion part now. So what we've tried to do uh, with Chinese travelers is we've tried to figure out how do we get them to Greenland and what can we um, do to, to create a, a storytelling around Greenland here in China. And one of the first things that I found out, I wrote a, a short piece on uh, on Chinese travelers um, uh, six or seven years ago, it is now that I had published. Uh, and that was focusing on the term that we call donkey friends. Um, Chinese language is very funny in the sense that you can play on the tones in it. Um, so Luyo means to travel and Luyo is a, is, a, is a friend, a donkey friend that takes with you. And this is actually based on how Chinese people uh, started traveling uh, very early on. So when China opened up very seriously in the late 90s, um, what happened was that a lot of local Chinese, for example, here in Beijing or in Shanghai or in other cities or even smaller, would gather around the uh, transit areas. So just across the street from me is a place called Dongzhumen, which was the long bus hall area. Um, but there were also short-term buses, and, and people would then meet up every weekend and then take these buses out. And these were organized by people who knew the local area uh, where they were going, or people who had some sort of hobby interest in going to a specific area. So some of the first trips were to the, uh, the Qing tombs, uh, some went to just the Great Wall. Uh, late 90s, there weren't very many restrictions. You didn't even always have to take a ticket if you went to the right places on the wall. And these people became sort of, um, well, we didn't have social media at that time in the, in the early 2000s, but they became sort of people that you would follow, people that you, I think now it's called KOLs, but in the Chinese sense, it was basically just a good friend that you wanted to travel with. And this concept did not really change very much in China. So uh, the, whatever, what changed in China was the exposure that these people would get. And the, the the ability to monetize on this um, <laughs> on, the, yeah, on the ability to monetize on this, and they started being very specific on uh, bulletin boards, the electronic ones, and we saw later students who traveled abroad started to uh, advance or do more work based on more uh, travel travel packages or, or taking friends around based on the knowledge they had of being in Australia, in the US, and, and, um, and Europe. So um, a lot of um, travel products, especially the more specialized parts, were built on Chinese people who had traveled abroad, came back, or who knew their certain area. And what we then did in Albatross, again, around 2010 and 12, was we tried to either create our own uh, influences here in China and Greenland, um, we had a very nice woman called Ms. Wang, who, um, of course, Chinese, she spoke fluently, but she spoke fluent English and German too. Um, and she had um, worked for a German company and we came in contact with her because she has been writing for the National Geographics here in, uh, in, in China. And she had a, 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 a you would call a fetish or a, a hobby for Arctic areas 
and we introduced Greenland to her, brought her to Greenland and sort of gave her the the walk around. And she actually ended up staying um, in uh, both up in Tula and she stayed in Kulusuk in the east. And she, she spent many, many months there. And uh, it's sort of a funny, uh, cute side thing is that she looks actually very Greenlandic. She's uh, northern Chinese and has these northern chinese mongolian features so a lot of the greenlandics when she came were like oh you're from the south or something she's like no no i'm from china so she made this connection so we built uh trips around her uh, and later on what we then did was um for the cruise part we had a very nice cruise in 2017 um with a chinese tour operator called kaisa who chartered a whole ship for the west coast and then we could go in and start molding the trip because one of the things about the cruising is that you have some on board and then you can start doing a lot of uh, when you get off the cruise ship. So we tried to engage the local communities. We had um, we were lucky when we went to um, near Gunat, just close to Umanak, that we saw uh, local Greenlandic hunters bringing home the seals they had caught and they would actually cut open the seal for us um, and uh, we had 16 Chinese tourists standing around the seal taking pictures it, while they were eating the raw seal meat uh, together with the local uh, Greenlandic hunter. Um, and for that was actually sort of the high point or the high part of, of how we engaged with the Chinese tourists because the Chinese tourists we found are the opposite, direct opposite of what you would usually connect with or, or uh, think about as a Chinese tourist, which are the ones that move in groups, that um, have this trophy travel, uh, we used to call it, where they need to cover as many places as possible. And what they actually wanted was the interaction with the local community. Uh, they wanted to understand Greenlandic culture. And of course, food was a huge thing for them. Uh, they are very hooked on seafood, any kind of seafood. So we took them to um, uh, Spekbade. We took them to a local uh, seafood dealer in um, in Sisimiut. And we took them to have uh, sushi in, uh, in uh, Iluliset. And in that way, we sort of tried through these influences and local Chinese we knew. And I guess we have to have a continuum uh, upgrading of the product. And um, one of the things we learned is that Chinese tourists really like to be active. So they want to engage in whatever they do. They want to be part of it. They want to be sucked into it and disappear in it. While at some, at some point they may have a, a companion, either the husband or the wife, that will, that will photograph and, 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 and video everything that happens. And so they can document it when they come home because they have to, of course, show it to their friends back home in, in, in China. So for us, that has been an evolving thing. Uh, and it, it kind of spilled over into when we started doing our Antarctica trips too, that the product didn't need to change very much, but what it needed to do was to try to pull in the, the, the Chinese tourists so they could feel that they were part of the destination. So um, it differed somewhat from what we had with the um, European and the American tourists in the sense that Chinese tourists don't really get tired. They can run 14 hours straight as long as something fun is happening. Uh, and if you can engage them there, they will do more or less everything. Um, we also had a, a, what we call a small survival course where we took out all the survival equipment we have in the base, uh, in our base camp uh, set up in Kangas Luswak. And we went through the rifle, uh, the thermo um, coverage and, uh, how to survive in the uh, in the Arctic wilderness if you get uh, stranded there, um, and we had a huge engagement from Chinese tourists based on that. Um, what we then later discovered was that um, when we looked at the two hundred we had with us, and also the trips we then sell on, is that it's extremely hobby based. So uh, Greenland compared to let's say what I call the the low Arctic areas, Finland, uh, North Norway. Uh, is high Arctic, especially if you really start going high up in Greenland. So the area around the Disco Bay and up north and the whole eastern coast up into the national uh, parks are there's the true Arctic areas where you can actually experience that nature is stronger than you. There is no refuge in Greenland from nature. 
Uh, and that also means that the, the, the tourists you get from China have to be aware of that before they go. So we spent quite a long time explaining to them that when you go to Greenland, your experience will change and we cannot make you, well, we can make you a fixed itinerary, but if the weather isn't what it's supposed to be, we'll do something else. Um, and that is sort of a thing, again, of an evolving thing that we are into that we need to have backup stuff. Because if this fails, it's not good to go to the Chinese tourists and say, you guys have to hang out in the hotel room for the next few hours. If you tell them it fails because of the weather, but we have this great alternative for you and we'll go do it again right now. Uh, either we'll go fishing just by, uh, by the pier or we'll try to go find a local um, Greenlandic cultural uh, experience for you. Or we'll maybe even put the shopping here now. We were supposed to have it tomorrow. So in that way, it needs, as a tour operator, you need to have an enormous amount of flexibility and you need to have a whole bag you can just dig into and, and offer an alternative. Um, and then we were also struggling a little bit with uh, Finland as a destination compared to Greenland. Uh, they are completely different. But when you look at the pictures and the marketing material, you can be, uh, you can mistaken that Finland and Greenland are somehow, are somehow the same. And the price for, especially for Asian tourists, is very different. So for us, it's 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 just as as much an information or a, a mission on informing uh, people here in China that Greenland is different. Um, what we've been playing around with lately is that we, I noticed that um, right now it's super popular for Chinese women to see live streams from Korea and the capitals around Europe, where Actually, there is a Korean woman that stands, uh, or a Chinese woman, sorry, that stands and changes clothes all the time. And then she has about uh, five to 10 million followers that then buy the clothes that she wears and she talks about it. And one of the things that we, we see them doing it too, they walk around Copenhagen, go into each shop, the Echo store. We go into seeing um, the um, uh, any clothing store, bag stores, Paris, London. So that's sort of the biggest thing right now that they can sit at home with their phones during COVID and actually have someone shop for them and they have multiple choices. And one of the dreams we are is that we'll actually give them a virtual live stream tour of Iluliset and maybe Kangas Lusuak and even try to go into some of the small Arctic shops uh, and let them see what an authentic uh, Greenlandic product looks like. Um, because that is, one of the ways to get again an engaged audience here in China is that you can give them and offer them something unique and this live streaming part is good. Um, so these are Greenland is a is a great place to get to experience uh, nature culture and the Arctic and it's also a great big playground for tour operators where you can test uh, anything on your tourists and uh, hopefully it will be a, a success for it. So, um, so that was sort of on my side, and then um, I would like to thank Tani for taking her time to uh, showing people what Greenland was uh, before I started going into how we we get the Holden and, and sell to Chinese tourists. A very interesting story, uh, fascinating how you started communicating with the Chinese market and developed that story. That, that's very interesting. An interesting destination. Thank you to Tani as well. Um, I could imagine there are several Chinese um, agencies watching and would be interested in getting in touch with you two. You two will be on our um, expo show and you have your booth. And I would just recommend people from China or for wherever. We have people from, from Bahamas to Kenya, so there are a lot of international audience that they reach out to you too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.